snacks. And this talk is going to be fairly high level. I'm going to start by just giving an overview of what they are and why you might want to use them. And then I'm going to run through a selection of options which are currently available, which I think are cool for various reasons. Speak closer to the Okay. Can you hear me better now? So it is a zero-knowledge snack, it is a subset of zero-knowledge proofs which have additional properties such as being very small and easy to verify, and it stands for zero-knowledge succinct non-interactive argument of knowledge. And I claim that they are useful for blockchain applications. Um, what does it allow you to do? A zero-knowledge proof allows you to demonstrate that you have run some protocol correctly. And precisely what that protocol is, it might be a way of saying that you have done your tax return correctly, it might be a way of saying that you have encrypted a message correctly, it doesn't really matter. What's important is that there is a protocol and you have run the protocol exactly as it is specified. And then what a verifier will do is it will just take your proof and say, yes, I agree, or no, I don't agree. Uh, the other nice thing about them is that they allow the user to keep some of their inputs to the protocol confidential. So for example, with the I have encrypted the message example, you could do that without revealing what the message actually was. So the example we've just seen, the roll-up example, is a classic thing where snarks are good because the verification is cheaper than the actual computation itself. So what it um, essentially means is that you can have a I'm saying minor, it probably wouldn't be a minor, but let's say that it's a minor, who receives lots and lots of transactions, and all of these transactions have been signed. The minor can then create a proof that it has run the verification algorithm for each of the signatures in these transactions, and the verification has returned to true. And then, when it broadcasts the transaction to all of the other nodes, rather than having to compute this verification themselves, they can just check the proof, and this is much, much cheaper for them to do, so that's great. The other nice thing that Snacks allow you to do is they allow you to achieve some level of privacy. So if you're wanting to hide the contents of a transaction. For example, suppose you have a buyer, suppose you have a merchant, and your buyer wants to buy some produce, but they don't necessarily want you to know exactly what they're buying. So the case I have given is for apples, but actually if you're talking in the business situation, if you have companies, then the chances of them wanting to broadcast to the world, to the competitors, precisely what they're buying every single time they use a blockchain is quite small. So this is quite a realistic application. So what would happen, you'd have a transaction which would say, send 10 apples to buyer A, and you encrypt that transaction, put it on the blockchain. But the thing is, you now need to additionally prove that you actually do have 10 apples to send to buyer A, because otherwise this would be something which would completely break the integrity of the blockchain, and that would be a problem. So you run a snark, the snark hides precisely what merchandise you're sending, and all you can see is that yes, I do actually have the merchandise that I'm sending in this transaction. So, for developers, if you're wanting to use these things but you don't want to get into the details of how they work, then a great tool you can use is Socrates. And you will need to learn precisely how to encode the programs, that is a barrier to entry, but you don't need to learn how the proving algorithm works for the snacks, you can just take that as a given. Can you speak up more? Oh, sorry. <laughs> So just to summarise what these things are, they are an interaction between a prover and a verifier where the prover is showing that they've followed a protocol and the verifier is saying whether or not they believe you. They need to be correct. An honest prover can always convince an honest verifier. They need to be zero knowledge. The verifier learns nothing from the prover apart from the fact that the statement is true. And most importantly, and actually most difficult to achieve, zero knowledge is quite easy. Soundness. It's not easy, we've spent 30 years trying to get some sufficient. And this is the idea that only a prover who has actually followed the protocol can convince an honest verifier. So before I run through a by snarks, which is sort of what I'm mostly focusing on, I'm going to talk about some situations where you would perhaps not want to use a pairing by snark, where there would be better solutions in the literature um, that you could use. The first one being if you're only trying 
intending to run your computation once. So the thing with snarks is kind of the way they work, kind of the way they get their efficiency, is they have this big pre-processing phase right at the start where the verifier is going to do a ton of work just to get um, a string of information which it can later refer to in order to massively speed up its verification. And this means that if you're later verifying 100 proofs, 1,000 proofs, it's really good. But if you're only going to use it once, then that is a total waste of time. You'd be better off using something else. And in particular, things that are good for this tend to be Ligero, Starks, Aria, Aurora. Um, these are designed for one-off computations, and another nice benefit of them is that they are typically quantum secure. Also, they have very fast provers. Another situation where you would not use snarks, if the program that you're trying to prove is very, very small. So a typical example of this would be range proof. So if you're trying to prove that something is between 0 and 2 to the 64, we can represent that program very efficiently. It costs 128 gigs or something like that. So in this situation, a snark is actually going to give you some concrete overhead, which means that the great asymptotics that you would be benefiting from in a more large uh, computation, you wouldn't see the benefits of this in that situation. And you'd be better off using something like bulletproofs, which, while practically it's um, sorry, while asymptotically it's perhaps less good for very small statements the actual concrete overhead is so small that that's not going to come into effect. <coughs> and one last situation is when the thing that you're proving is a very specific computation for which we have a very specific solution. Okay, so SNARKs are quite powerful, they cover MP, you can do general purpose computations with them, but sometimes you don't need that. Sometimes, for example, with SNARK proofs, if you're trying to say, I know a secret key, you could run a SNARK proof and that would be far better than running a SNARK. The time when you do want to use a SNARK is when you are proving the same program, the same application, the same the set of constraints many, 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 many times. Okay? Because this is really the situation where that pre-processing stage that you don't start is going to benefit you, you're going to reap the rewards. So, the benefits, they tend to have very small proof sizes, and by small I mean a couple of hundred bytes. Likewise, the verification tends to be really fast, but they do often need trusted setup, which is a downside. Also, they rely on some funky assumptions, and by funky assumptions I do not mean wrong assumptions, we can't break them. What I mean is that we don't understand them very well, and that makes us uncomfortable. Um, and finally, and this is also a pretty important point, the provers are not cheap. The provers can be a big barrier to actually using these things in practice. So, now to run through a few schemes. The first one, if all you need is speed. ROT16 is the fastest snark in the literature. It has the smallest proof size, the fastest verification time, the fastest prover time. It's generally great. It's wasn't just sort of made up out of thin air, it's actually the result of a huge line of works, starting from Gennaro and others who found a really nice way to encode the programs that we're trying to prove, which was later then um, people found a way to turn that into rank one constraint systems, which are the general standard that people tend to use now for encoding constraints. And then there was a line of papers that were each optimizing, getting rid of group elements that weren't needed, getting rid of verification processes that weren't needed, Finishing with Grot's scheme, which is in the generic group model. The downside here is that there is a trusted setup. And I'm going to do a very, very quick explanation of what I mean by that. But if you don't understand me, then don't worry, because it will be quick, I promise. So before the prover and the verifier can run, I was saying that there's this expensive trusted setup process, well, sorry, this expensive pre-processing um, step. But in pairing based snacks, it's actually worse than that because the um, step we do at the start, some of the inputs to this pre-processing have to be secret in order for you to have a secure scheme at the end. And worse than that, the secrets are very structured and we actually don't know how to generate them without somebody knowing what they are. So we can get around this. But largely the way we get around this is we have many, many participants all having a little bit of the secret 
and uh, working together to output the parameters that the actual prover and verifier use. And this is kind of nice in the sense that if all of the parties collude, then sure, you don't get any guarantees whatsoever. But if a single one of those parties is honest, then sure, there could be other points of failure, but your main bet you're not going to have the point of failure being that the trusted setup had colluding parties. Okay? <coughs> and sometimes this is enough. For example, if you have a closed set of participants where you don't have people joining and leaving at any point in time, but you just say have a hundred people that are always the same, then they can just run the trusted setup process themselves. And because they have run it, been part of the process, they know that it's okay, they know that they themselves are honest, and that's great. And then they can, they can use CROT16, which is the fastest scheme in the literature. Likewise, if you have a way to actually verify that the that any given computation that has been proven is wrong, then at least you would know something bad has happened. And this can, can be the case. For example, you have these things called sharks, which is where you have your proof being like a bulletproof thing, which doesn't have trusted setup. But then you also run a snark on top of it in order to get the verification costs down. But you still have the original proof, so you can still at least check that the original proof holds. Um, also, very rare situation for decentralized technologies. But if you do have a central trusted party, then no problem. Um, one nice thing about SNARKs is that they are very highly parallelizable. And there's a work called DISIC which explains exactly how to do this, not just for the group exponentiations, but also for the fast Fourier transforms. So if you're looking to parallelize SNARKs, then I definitely recommend taking that one out. Another really cool thing you can do with SNARKs you can have a snark of a snark of a snark of a snark that a snark is verifies. And every single time you run another step in the recursion, uh, run another snark, you get something which is smaller and cheaper to verify, meaning that the full system will be really uh, small and really fast to verify. This isn't as simple as it sounds. Um, in particular, the security assumptions which you're basing your snarks on can blow up in size if you do this wrong. So there have been works which have looked into precisely how you should lay out the format of your recursion such that your security assumptions still hold. Also, important in the case of SNARKs where you have this specific way of uh, representing your program, you need to be able to represent your SNARK verifier. And this is what Ben Sassen and others did when they introduced something called MMT curves which are basically a specific type of pairing which you are able to represent inside a snark. Which means that if you want to do layers of recursion, you can. Another situation you might come across is if you cannot do a setup. I mean, this is... Uh, you're still going to need to have some kind of setup process, to be honest, but you can have a situation where you have an updatable setup where at any point in time a new person can come along, add some new randomness to the system and then be part of that setup process. So it doesn't need to be a fixed thing with a fixed set um, cutoff point. And this basically means that it's much easier to actually run a trusted setup process which is secure, much easier to audit, much easier to have people taking part, much easier to just generally manage. Uh, but probably more importantly, you can have a universal setup. So typically when you're doing snark setups, you would have one setup per application. So if you're doing a range proof, you need a setup. If you're doing a Zcash, you need a setup. If you're doing Coda, you need a setup. And also, if your setup, you do your setup and then you happen to learn that something you did in your protocol is actually wrong, maybe you missed a minus sign, then you have to do the whole process again. Whereas with an updatable setup, you don't need to do that. You have just a single setup pixel, and this is quite nice because it means that you can coordinate it, you can make sure that there's lots of companies, lots of participants, lots of governments, lots of individual people taking part in just that one setup, and that would be the only setup that you would need to audit. 
So this is what sonic, sonic proofs do. They design zero-knowledge proofs, which are very nice if you want a universal setup. The catch with these is that they are actually only efficient if you're in a position where you can aggregate. So if you have an aggregation party who can put all the proofs together and help out other verifiers, then they're really efficient and they're great. And these, they, these have also been improved by Gavison. If you cannot aggregate, then there have been a couple of works recently, one called Plonk, the other called Marlin, which do not need any um, aggregation. They do have the downside that the proof sizes are a bit larger, we're now talking like a kilobyte rather than a couple of hundred bytes, but they don't need an aggregator. If you're willing to have your proofs be a bit bigger, there's also quite a nice line of works, which is, well, work, which is also universal and updatable, which is called Libra, not the Facebook currency. <laughs> and the nice thing about this, I mean, what they were focusing on is getting down the proof of computation, but what I think is really cool about it is that they do not need very large fast Fourier transforms. They can get away with just very little ones. And this means that if you're actually trying to represent the program, and then you can use a field which doesn't need to have a large device of two, and this gives us a lot more flexibility when we're actually using it. So to summarize, pairing-based snacks can be small and fast to verify, they can be paralyzed, let's get that third part, they can be quickly, they can be universal and updatable, and they can be made quicker to prove, but slower to verify, if that's what you want. Thank you very much. There we go. Um, so, yeah, this one has larger prover, smaller prover computation, but slightly larger proofs. Uh, you mentioned the uh, shuffle arguments when you said the gens graph and the accumulators. Uh, who wrote that paper? Oh gosh, there's been quite a lot of shuffle arguments. <laughs> Jello C research system project. I can't answer. I'll ask you after. Cool. Is that everything? Oh, no. Apart from the Q correct scheme, what other um scheme is Um so one recent one was well. If you use the bulletproofs in a product argument, then you get a polynomial commitment scheme. And this is actually what Halo, the work released by Zcash does. They use the bulletproofs in a product argument, which has a downside that you have no verification if you just run it as a one-off. But if you're aggregating, then you have a situation where you can um, have the linear verification be your one-off cost, and then just have a logarithmic factor on top of it for each individual proof which means that you can get something that's quite fast in that situation. There's, those are the two that I think are just really used.